What's up, everyone? I'm John David, also known as the Mafia Hairdresser. Last week, I shared the tale of my dramatic ejection from my parents' home. Rude, right? This week, get ready for an explosive episode as I dive into my Mafia Hairdresser days. Trust me, it's a wild ride that's intrinsically linked to my roller coaster relationship with my mother. This podcast started as a collection of short stories, but that's all changed. I scrapped that. You're now listening in near time with nearly not enough time to edit, me exploring the highs and lows, the laughs and tears that I shared with my mother. It's evolved into a mommy and me passion project and it feels like my mother's spirit is right here guiding each and every word that i share with you you know in fact i know that is true if you're on the move make sure to download this episode or better yet kick back and immerse yourself in our insane story i'm here to narrate the madness hooked on the mafia hairdresser chronicles saga you will be after this episode yeah Don't forget to smash that like and subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Amazon, Audible, and SoundCloud. Dropping us a review or a comment? Yeah, we would love to hear your thoughts. Grab your copies of my novels, Mafia Hairdresser, and its sequel, The Glow Stick Gods, available in both ebook and paperback on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Dive deeper into those underworlds and more at MafiaHairdresser.com. Of course, both books have been turned into a serial podcast. Just scroll back about 60 episodes. Are you curious about more true crime tales? Rewind through our feed to find my podcast about the dream job turned nightmare at the Boca Raton Resort. It's a deep dive into corporate deceit and the impact of a billion dollar blunder on the little guy. It's called John David and Goliath. So stay tuned and let's unravel the mafia hairdresser years together right here on How I Killed My Mother. So where were we? Oh yes, I fell in love with a boy and mom found out. So she took me to a shrink and we got the lying ears. And when mom found out that I was lying and living a double life under her own roof and rediscovering my penchant for the same sex, mommy dearest practically shoved me out with a broomstick while dad put his foot down, which left me with the clothes on my back and $200 in my pocket. I hope it's clear and reasonable to think that my situation could have been nothing short of my world had just been crumbled. I had no place to live. I had only saved $200 for my future and I was fucked. But I didn't feel that way. I had ignorance and youth on my side. If I had as little resources, no income, no car, and no experience under my belt, and I fell into that same situation today, I would have been crushed. I'd have given up. I could not handle that today. Because losing everything would mean that I had lost everything I had gained in my life thus far. But I was young, and I lost nothing but my job and a car and some clothes. Not a lifetime of things. I was a clean slate. I didn't know what I was missing or what could be. Ignorance is bliss, I tell you. I had never experienced hardships like the one I was about to unknowingly encounter, so I was just going to handle what I could step by step. I was an adult, and adults figured things out, right? I was just beginning the movie of my life in my mind, A rags to riches story where I would rise like a phoenix, triumphant, wealthy, and above the deceit and the cruelty that was once inflicted upon me by my unfair parents, fueled by anger, one of my youthful go-to superpowers. When I walked out that day with my boyfriend, I was determined to spite my mother by being successful and rich and powerful. I would show her... Ignorance, anger, delusion, dash of ego, and youth, these were the ingredients that I would use in my recipe of revenge. Success would be my dish. Now, before I tell you about the mafia hairdresser period, I have to tell you why I let myself work for the Chicago mobster who hired me to be his spy in his organization. And the reason was empty nest syndrome. You think I'm going to bring up that cuckoo bird analogy, right? Yeah, no. 
You see, after I was kicked out of my house, I became the head of a household, a family man, a father figure, a parent. And even though there was so much anger and resentment between my mom and myself, my mom relished every minute of hardship I went through trying to raise a bratty broken child. And when that child flew the coop after I got her through college, I wanted nothing more to do with family, anything, so I became the mafia hairdresser. I didn't speak to my parents for a few weeks after my parents kicked me out, but my mom would not stand for non-communication. In a phone call, she made it clear to me that I was not excommunicated from the family. And that was cool. I mean, I was actually pretty scared of suddenly being on my own. My mom reached out to me to assure me that she was still my mom and dad was still there if I really got into trouble. And that meant the world to me. I accepted the olive branch because I needed my mom. And though part of me hated her and still wanted to rub her nose in my future success, just as soon as I attained it, I loved my mom. When I walked away from the family, I had decided to move forward with my plans, which included finishing up beauty school and then moving to Long Beach to live with Chuck, who would be my new family. And as fate would have it, I picked up a few members to our family along the way. We immediately walked down my parents' long driveway, got into Chuck's car, and he drove to our friend Maria's apartment, 20 minutes away in Laverne, California. Maria was still a high school singer, so she lived with her mother, Christine, and her 13-year-old sister, Stephanie. And they lived in a two-bedroom crap apartment in a complex right off Foothill Boulevard, which is like Route 66, and it was called the Family Tree Apartments. Chuck and I had met Maria the summer after I graduated from high school. Maria and her best friend Cindy had joined the next year's rifle twirling team, and both Chuck and I trained them for the 8081 school's twirling team. During my first year of college and then my transition to beauty school, Maria and Cindy became one of the first Glendore people we were out to. We all became very close, and it was Cindy's brother, Bernie, who worked in a Hollywood uh, hair salon doing movie and TV stars, who convinced me to become a hairdresser after I quit college. Graciously, Christine, Maria's mom, took pity on me and suggested that I move in temporarily with her and her two daughters. And that felt comfortable. I was so relieved and appreciative that I offered up the 200 bucks in my pocket for her hospitality. But soon I wished I had never given her any money and had just saved up to get my own apartment. Christine was a single mom who worked odd jobs via a temp agency. With both of her daughters attending the same Glendore High School and me going to beauty school, which was just a few miles away, Christine could drop us off and then go to her jobs, we thought. And in the very first week I lived with the girls, I got a job as a box boy at an Alpha Beta grocery store. Ironically, Maria worked after school and on weekends at my dad's gas stations. She was adorable in those Shell and Arco uniforms. To have a cute girl with a darling princess haircut that I cut, pumping your gas and changing your oil in your car was a 1981 irregularity. Dad loved having Maria work there because she was so nice and the customers loved her. I had hired Maria long before my parents kicked me out and fired me from my management job at the service stations. At first, Christine and her car was the only car that she and her girls and me could rely on to shuttle us all to school and jobs and jobs after work and back to the family tree apartments 20 minutes away from our schools and jobs. In that first week or two, my dad was also more than happy to help Maria and I get to where we needed to be. And then very shortly after I got my job at the grocery store, dad and mom relented and gave me my car back. They said they were proud of me that I had from nothing found lodging a job and was still going to beauty school while simultaneously shopping and cooking for my lady hosts. Christine was a beauty youthful in her 30s. And she had a goal of meeting and marrying one of the many men of her dreams, which happened to be actors who played detectives on TV detective shows. Christine had gone so far as to put together a list of shows she loved and the actors who started them that she wanted to love her back. Beretta, starring Robert Blake. Banachek, starring George Papard. Petrocelli, starring Barry Newman. Toma, starring Tony Masante. Del Vecchio, starring Judd Hirsch and Serpico, starring David Burney. I think she dated half of them. Both Maria and I were putting our incomes into the pot so we could supplement Christine's rent and groceries and gas. But we were always getting notices from the Family Tree Apartments management that the rent was late and we never seemed to have enough food. We were always running out of gas for my car as well. 
It turns out that Christine, unbeknownst to Maria and me, spent much of the time when she should have been working her temp jobs to hunt down and find those TV actors. At night, she went to parties where she thought they would be, confident that there was a man in the house at night to make sure her girls were safe. And she shopped and spent her money on attractive short dresses, gas for her car, and valet parking. In just a few months of stretching pennies and scraping the bottom of what I could do creatively with ketchup, bread, and pasta, Maria and I came to realize that we could live better if we just moved out on our own. Christine was bleeding us dry, and I was sick of the responsibility of being the man of the house while sleeping on a fold-out sofa in the living room of the Family Tree Apartments while Christine was spending all of my income. And that is what we did. Maria and I got our own two-bedroom apartment, closer to both of our schools and our jobs. We moved out, and we also took Maria's little sister, Stephanie, with us. And Christine gave us her blessing. I had just turned 19. Maria was now 17, going on 18. Stephanie was still 13, going on 14. An older couple who lived across the archway from us were our landlords, and we told them that me and Maria were married. I don't even know if they believed us, but they chose to let us live there. We're very thankful for that. And Chuck stayed with us often, and we all became a little family. We even got a pet boa constructor for Stephanie. The three of us lived together in that cozy Glendora complex with a pool, and we somehow managed to furnish it beautifully until Maria graduated from high school, and I graduated from beauty school. It was one of the hardest and rewarding years of my life because I had to step up and be as close to a dad as Stephanie would let me be. Now, all through this time, my mom and I were not on unspeaking terms. In fact, I came home for family birthdays, theirs and mine, and holidays, and Maria and Stephanie came with me most of the time, but not Chuck. My relationship with Chuck was a black hole topic not to be discussed. It was an unmentionable wall between my mom and me, buttressed with the unspoken anger and resentment between my mom and me. Would we had tried to speak of or work out our fury to each other? I'm sure it would have ignited another war which would have only added Maria and Stephanie to the list of war casualties, which included my shell-shocked dad and my brother. So mom and me just stuck to the topics at hand, which was my new family minus Chuck. But you know, my mom's wish for me had come to fruition. I, I shouldn't even say wish. I should say the curse or spell my mom had cast upon me since I was a teenager came to be when I felt the humiliation, the desperation, the helplessness, and the bottomless exhaustion of what it was like to have a child who did everything in her power to disarm my own. It didn't take for but a few weeks of living with the two young ladies to understand that Stephanie needed a strong parental figure, and her sister was only going to step up so much. Stephanie was a horrible child, and yet I felt I had to take care of her while she gave me all that shit that I had once given to my own mother. Stephanie was a little girl. She was also cute and innocent looking as can be. But she was dark, and she was super smart. But she needed a stable home, one that Christine had not provided. My own mother had kicked me out of the house for lying and cheating, but Stephanie's mother had let her sister and an 18-year-old best friend take her away because the mom wanted to enjoy a few slut years without the burden of raising her daughters. Harsh, huh? That was enough to make Stephanie a pissed off and confused, cute, little, dark, smart girl. I see why she was the way she was now. But when I was living with her, she was just a devil who needed a very firm parental figure. So I became my mom in a way that I had not consciously set out to do. Between her sister Maria and me swapping my car back and forth to each other for our jobs in school, I found that I was the best homemaker. My own mother had taught me to cook and clean and do laundry. So planning meals and shopping and preparing lunches for the next day was something that I was in charge of. So when I also assumed the head of the household position, Stephanie was right there to sabotage and undermine me, which was her way of expressing how fucked up she thought her own life was. I don't want to make sandwiches, she'd say. 
Stephanie, please, I'd beg while folding laundry. I'm tired and I have to pick up Maria from work so she can drop me off at the grocery store. You're doing it wrong. I don't know what this is or even how to fold it. You're supposed to fold your clothes. It's a jumper. And folding clothes is more of a happy task. I was too depressed to fold clothes. I mean, why did they kill John Lennon? You're always depressed, Stephanie. Did you do your homework? That was a happy task. There were many times when I would be rushing to get to school or work or dropping the girls off somewhere, and Stephanie would purposely not be ready on time. She drove me crazy. And the fact that both her and her sister were both girls simply made life more challenging than it had to be in the first place. We all shared a bathroom, and sometimes for... And sometimes, for no particular reason, they'd gang up on me and make me feel stupid for just saying a sentence that sounded funny to them. At one point early on, Stephanie was darker and more depressed than usual. She cried and cried that week and said she wanted to move back with Christine, who had by then moved far away. And me and Maria let her. But a few days later, Stephanie sadly realized that she had a better home life with me and her sister. See, Christine by that time had become accustomed to living alone and taking men home whenever she liked. Stephanie, unfortunately, did not fit in with her mother's new and improved freer childless lifestyle. So she moved back in with us. I called my mom so many, 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 many times in the two and a half years when devil child Stephanie lived with me, crying on my mom's shoulder when I was at my wit's end. And mom would always point out how I did the same thing to her. And yet, I turned out all right, she said. And it didn't take me long to realize that, yeah, I turned out all right. But what about mom? I was now the mom. And I was being psychologically abused every day by Stephanie. And she was going to probably turn out all right. But I didn't know if I was going to come out of this okay. How did my mother do it with me? And was she all right? I was beginning to have empathy for my mother for having a son like me. You might be surprised to hear this, but I did keep my grudge against my mom. But during those calls, I began to apologize to her. Blubbering, I'd tell my mom that I was so sorry that I was such a bad kid And she loved every second of every tear and every apology. My mom got what she wanted. I had a kid who was tearing the soul from my body. One day, I was left to take Stephanie to school before I went to beauty school. Maria had spent the night at Cindy's house after going to a concert. I popped into Maria and Stephanie's room to give Stephanie the usual 10-minute warning, but she was still in bed. Stephanie, I said, what are you doing? I have to take you to school. We cannot be late. I don't want to go, she said, pulling the covers over her face. As usual, I was rushed. I had to get the kid to school, and then I had to get to where I was supposed to be. Stephanie, I warned. If you are not up and dressed in ten minutes, I swear I will come in there and I will dress you myself. I was tired of Stephanie's sullen and withdrawn demeanor around the apartment of late. Something had been bothering her, and yet she had not told me what it was yet. But I didn't have time for any of her shit that morning, so I opened the door and I screamed, Now! And then I slammed the door behind me, thinking that my tough dad act would work. But it did not. After ten minutes, Stephanie was still in bed. I did what I had to do, something my mom would have done. I marched into Stephanie's room and I sternly informed Stephanie that the three of us living under the same roof was a pickle of a situation. I think I even said that so stupid, which I knew she was going to tease me for later. But if she did not go to school, we would probably be found out by truancy officers and we'd be put in jail. And then Stephanie would be put up for adoption because her mother was unfit. Harsh. I know. But if there was anything that I had learned from my own mother parenting me, it was to use as many psychological tricks on your excessively manipulative smart child as you had to. You don't want to be taken away, I said. Do you? I don't care, she screamed from under the blanket. It would be better than living here with you. 
What she said hurt my feelings, but I had been getting used to that. I had been called a loser, a weirdo, faggy, and vain. So, as my mom advised me to do, where it concerned Stephanie in these types of situations, I tried to focus on what was needed to be happening. I felt I had to get Stephanie to school because Maria was not at home. It was my job to get Stephanie to where she was supposed to be. So I pretended to act upon my original threat. I walked into her bedroom and ripped the blankets and sheets off of Stephanie as if I was going to strip her and dress her. And then Stephanie screamed, as only a 13-slash-14-year-old girl could do. It was one of those screams that I feared my landlords across the archway would be tempted to call the police for. Get out! yelled Stephanie. Don't you dare touch me, you pervert! You're sick! You deranged, perverted child molester! Get out! Get out! Get out! Perv! Perv! Help! Help! I was startled and scared speechless. I didn't know what to do but back out of her room. And then she jumped out of bed and slammed the door in my face. Stephanie, I said timidly. I'm getting dressed right now, pervert. Anything to get out of this apartment with you, you freak. Rapist. I was so scared. I had never seen Stephanie like this. I didn't know what to do. So I called my mom. Of course, Mom laughed and relished every minute of our quick conversation before Stephanie dashed out of her room fully clothed and walked straight to the kitchen door and into my car. Before I got off the phone and drove Stephanie to school in bone-chilling silence, Mom told me that I'd find out soon enough what the tantrum was all about and not to worry. Whatever Stephanie was going through, it wasn't about me. But let me tell you, it sure felt like it was about me. God damn it, if Mom wasn't right. That night when I got home from work, Stephanie was already in bed, but Maria was home and had waited up for me. She told me for Stephanie that Stephanie was sorry. Maria had gotten the whole story of why Stephanie was so moody that week. It turns out some of Stephanie's freshman classmates had found out that she was living with her sister and an older man, and that was unusual. So, as kids do... Those kids found something about that fact to tease Stephanie about. Stephanie didn't know what to do with the embarrassment or feelings she had for the situation. I mean, after all, she was dealing with the mom abandonment issues as well. So Stephanie took it out on me. Once again, I called my mom that night and I apologized to her for all the years. I did the same sort of things to her all because I was experiencing pain or confusion in my own childhood life. I had called my mom a monster, a murderer, uncaring, a brown noser, and a shrew, simply because I may have gotten into a fight at school and lost, or I was stressed out because I was avoiding something like telling them I broke the basement window or lost my retainer for the 10th time. After me and Maria graduated, we kept the family together and set up house with Chuck in a three-bedroom apartment in Belmont Shores, Long Beach, that he had found just blocks away from the shore. And we lived there a year, sharing two cars. Chuck went to Long Beach State and waited tables, and Maria worked retail. And I worked at first with Bernie and then began apprenticing at Sebastian International in their salon called Cassandra 2000. I'll mention my brother suffered a bit because he was never allowed to visit me at our apartment because Chuck lived there too. Mom and I remained estranged from each other for that half of my life. Chuck was still the unmentionable and the barrier of anger between my mom and me that remained palpable. In Long Beach, we didn't know what to do with Stephanie. The high school she would have gone to was too far, or she didn't like it, I don't remember. But she came up with an alternative schooling that was close to where Maria worked, which was at the South Coast Plaza in Orange County. Maria and I, once again, as man and wife, enrolled our daughter, Stephanie, as a freshman at FITM, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandise, a college. Stephanie was smart and beyond her age and maturity, probably because of having lived with us and Christine before that. And I had excellent forging skills that fortified the illusion that Stephanie had a high school diploma. We had just bypassed the whole high school thing altogether by enrolling her in FIDM, which accepted Stephanie and took our money. In two years, Stephanie graduated with a degree in retail merchandising. 
Just before graduation, Fidim called me and my wife, Maria. Fidim found out that Stephanie was only 16 years old and had never graduated from high school. Me and Maria, mom and dad, pointed out that the press would have a heyday if they didn't give us Stephanie's degree. So they did. Great parenting, right? Ignorance to how things should or should not have been done was bliss for us. But you still would not be able to get away with this today. Maria and Stephanie moved out on their own, and Stephanie began doing all the windows for the new Gap stores, which were popping up in every mall and strip mall in Southern California. In another year, she had her own apartment, as well as her own retail window display company, and she worked her way up and down Southern California, the coast, all the way from Long Beach to San Diego. Then she got pregnant, and we had words, and then we never spoke again. And Maria began dating a nice young man whom I did not approve of, and she and I had words, and then we never spoke again. Not only had I had a touch of parenting in my time with Maria and Stephanie, but I had done it in exactly the way I thought my mom had done with me or to me. I felt I could tell those two girls who they should be, who they could be with, and how they should act. Only they were not my children. They were not mine. They were my friends. And I treated them very badly in the end. I miss them terribly, and I am sorry for my controlling behavior when I should have been supportive. (sighs) Now, if you want to hear the whole Mafia hairdresser story, you're going to have to scroll all the way back to the very first episode of this podcast stream and listen to the beginning of the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles, which is called Season 1 Mafia Hairdresser. It's the serial podcast adaptation of the original screenplay that shopped around movie studios in 1989 to 1992. Or you can just buy the novel at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. But here I'm going to tell you the very true and very synopsized edition of my story because it is also part of my story with my mother. You see, after Maria and Stephanie exited my life, I experienced what is normally called empty nest syndrome. By this time, I was 20 and 21, and I had begun working in Long Beach at a nice salon called John Don's Hair Designers. I was a really good hairdresser because I had worked with Bernie in Hollywood for a short time, and I had apprenticed at a high flutin salon called Cassandra 2000. Not to mention my beauty school, the Azusa Pacific, was they had the best teachers. And when I began working at John Don's and my name was John David, anyone who called for John Don got me. I was busy the minute I began working there. I was making buck. The problem was there was no one to share my spoils. The girls were gone and Chuck, my boyfriend, was working two jobs now and going to school full time. And he loved to read and be alone. And yeah, and he began pulling away from me because he was hiding a drinking problem. I had spent the last few years focusing on the girls, our little family, so I really didn't have a social circle and I didn't have any hobbies. I felt lost and bored. I rarely saw my mom and dad because without Stephanie or Maria to talk to or lament to my mother about, the only thing left was my job and Chuck. Chuck was still a non-starter topic. And whenever I told my mom how much money I was making or about the occasional celebrity whose hair I might have styled, she would always say something to knock my ego down a notch. Money isn't the only meter for success. Or, they're just people. Why are you bragging? She'd say. Knocking me down was an old habit she used so I wouldn't get such a big head when I was younger. Plus, there was still much underlying animosity between us that she took as many opportunities to throw digs at me as she could. And the fact that I was successful at a career that she had previously deemed not suitable for me didn't sit well with mom who liked to be right. So the chasm between us began to grow wider. Again. And I'm going to say mom was a little jealous of my success while she entered her own empty nest time. My brother was going to go to college in a year, so she was going to be out of the mother job shortly. I obviously had no need for her anymore. I avoided her. Also, my dad's gas stations were not doing so well, so he was going to have to sell them, which meant they were going to be in a financially precarious situation. Mom had no real social circles or a job. She did have lots of hobbies. She was an artist, an incredible artist. 
But nonetheless, mom also felt a little lost. And then I got a private client situation that seemed very interesting to me at a time when mom and I should have been getting closer to each other because we both felt lost. This was the mafia hairdresser days. His name was Smokey Topaz, which is the only name you're going to hear from me because I swore never to speak his real name aloud, and I never did, except for one time. He was a Chicago gangster, but I didn't know that at the time. I did his girlfriend's hair, and she was a nurse. He said that he needed a hairdresser, so she sent him into John Don's hair designers to see me. But Smokey Topaz saw me more than a hairdresser. He saw me as someone who could cut through more than just split ends. But instead of telling you about the introduction, I'm going to cut a clip from season one, Mafia Hairdresser of the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles, so you can hear how I met Smokey Topaz. It went like this. I got a real important business meeting tonight, buddy. Real important. So just trim it into what I already have, but shorter, but not too much shorter. I'm so sure. I never cut too much, and I clip hair on ears and eyebrows without asking, and I don't make hair over poofy. My hair is very important to me, Jess Boy. The last guy who cut off too much of my hair got something of his cut off. <laughs> so anyway, are you sure this is just a business meeting? Could it be a possible date? Sounds very important. Hello? Um, dude? Okay. <laughs> you are a wise guy. <laughs> I think I'm going to like you, Jess Boy. Yeah, you're a real good egg. <sighs> Say, buddy, I have an associate who just might need your services. I'm as but an egg man. I want you to do his wife's here. She could use your help. Mind if I pass on your good name? You'll make a lot of dough. Sure. Any friends of yours are friends of mine. Every hairdresser in the 80s wanted a private client at that time, one that paid you lots of money to do their hair in their home. It was the 80s, as I said, and money was glamorous, and everybody made so much of it, and I liked making money. Smokey Topaz made me an offer to do the couple's hair in Huntington Harbor for $4,000 a month. All I had to do was stop by two or three times per week to do this woman's hair and sometimes cut the husband's hair as well. But this was no ordinary couple in their 50s. The husband's automotive business was a front for Smokey Topaz's business of smuggling cocaine into Los Angeles, where he would then cut it up and distribute it to the Hollywood movie studios and the Hollywood record companies. At first, the wife was what we used to call a mouse burger, a Midwestern dowdy and depressed housewife who now had domestic help and bodyguards. During the first few weeks with her, I made her into a trophy wife. After that, we kind of fell in love with each other in a way, and I began to hang out at their house a lot to go shopping um, with her, and we would buy clothes, expensive clothes for ourselves and each other. And we went to really expensive dinners, sometimes with her husband. And we went to a lot of Hollywood parties, sometimes with Smokey. It wasn't too long until I realized I wasn't just being paid to do hers and her husband's hair. I was being paid to be the couple's babysitter and report back to Smokey when they had been bad. As cocaine sprinkled its way into my job description, the lines between haircuts and cut lines blurred. You see, Smokey Topaz was a Chicago gangster belonging to a Chicago gang. As a Chicago gangster, he was supposed to be out in Hollywood committing blackmail, juice loans, and extortion, and then send the money back to Chicago. Chicago gangsters at that time did not deal in cocaine. Nonetheless, Smokey Topaz saw an opportunity to use the couple's auto business to make a lot of money behind his Chicago boss's backs. He made enough money from the cocaine business to send enough money back to avert suspicion and still make plenty enough to be quite successful. Successful enough to pay a hairdresser 4000 bucks a month to keep an eye on his investment. 
The couple's business was a perfect front. Smokey purchased cocaine in Mexico, where Mexicans would mix the coke with resin and pour it into a mold of a car part. Dry it, paint it, then deliver the car part to a warehouse in Long Beach, California. Then Smokey's workers would dissolve away the resin and paint and dry out the coke, cut it, and then distribute it. He distributed to the very Hollywood moguls, actors, singers, and producers that Smokey used to shake down by blackmail, juice loans, and extortion. Those type of clients bought large batches of Coke. And I, unknowingly at first, was with him when he delivered those big batches of Coke at the Hollywood parties. The problem was the couple loved living the Hollywood life through Smoky Topaz. They loved dropping the briefcases full of Coke to the Hollywood producers at Hollywood parties. And they loved trying to act like the Coke business was their own at the Hollywood parties, especially when they were coked up themselves. And they loved the Coke. They were using their own product and they began losing their minds. And then when crack cocaine came on the scene, things got ugly in their Huntington Harbor home and beyond. And I was in the middle of all of that. Smokey Topaz was trying to keep the business running through them and about them. And they were becoming freakazoids, paranoid, fighting all the time and telling Smokey Topaz that they could drop him anytime and run the business themselves. One time I had to report to Smokey that I thought the wife was so high that I thought I heard her calling the cops on him so she and her husband could run the business themselves. Now, I had this home life with Chuck and I worked at John Don's Hair Designers. And then I was being that mafia hairdresser guy. I was living a double life. I couldn't tell the people at work what I was doing with the family and Smokey Topaz. And I couldn't tell anyone what or who these people were in the first place. And I wasn't doing a lot of coke, but I was doing it. I couldn't tell my boyfriend because I was starting to sense that he was having problems with drugs and alcohol. And of course, I couldn't lean on my mother or my father. They would never understand that me working on my second job was turning into a a scary cocaine nightmare. One time, one of the couple's security guys, uh, a guy who wore Hawaiian shirts all the time, who lived in the same complex in the Huntington Harbor, uh, was in their bedroom. He was lying down, and I thought he was asleep. I saw him when I went to the bathroom to get some hair supplies to do the wife's hair in the living room. When I got back into the living room, Smokey Topaz was there, and he yelled at me to stay out of the bedroom and to shut the door. I think the security guard was dead because I never saw him again. Was it an overdose or was he shot? I had no idea. I was privy to only some of Smokey Tobez's operation. I had seen the warehouse where the coke came in boxes that looked like car parts, um, but I had not seen the cutting room where they cut it up with baby powder or whatever they cut it up with because I was told that that room in the next room over, you couldn't breathe in there. There was a lot of money in suitcases, I saw that, and there were a lot of wrapped packages of coke in suitcases as well. In fact, the couple would give me bags of cocaine to take home, and I would promptly flush it all down the toilet because I did not want my friends to know anything about my moonlighting job. I mean, some of my friends and I had done coke occasionally, but if I was the guy giving out coke, it would have just got around too fast. So I never did coke at home, also because of Chuck, too. Once I flew with the couple to New Orleans for a vacation. I think they spiked my drink one night and I went to bed early. The husband snuck into my room and I'll just say I did not have a good time. And in that not good time, I hit him in the stomach where he had already previously been experiencing pain. This was before we found out his liver was failing. And I just want to pose the question to myself. Did I accelerate his death when I hit him that night? I don't know. Anyway, I was creeped out. And as soon as we got home back to Long Beach, I told Smokey the whole story and he let me go. He let me quit. He gave me 30 grand to shut my mouth and to keep it shut. Who knew that the mafia had a dental plan? 
I had already been gifted a 79 Coupe de Ville by the couple, so I walked away with a severance and a car and a little psychological damage. Oh, and I walked away with a really good fictional story called Mafia Hairdresser, which also branded me as the Mafia Hairdresser. Shortly after that, I wrote a business plan. I got a small business loan, and I took that money from Smokey Topaz, and I opened myself my own hair salon. At 24 years old, I had up to 19 employees. And it was then that my mom and I became close again. And that is what I'll tell you about in the next episode of How I Killed My Mother. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to subscribe and like and share this podcast with anyone that you think might like it. And your comments are always welcome. Please follow me, Mafia Hairdresser, on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Twitter, or Threads. Next week, you'll hear me try and turn the tables on my mom and make her go to a family therapist. It's the episode where me and my mom become friends again. 